What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to Homebrewed Christianity. And today on the podcast, you get not one, but two, two friends of the show. That's right, Diana Butler Bass and John Dominique Crossan are here, and we're talking the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus. That's right. We unpack a host of different uh, questions, um, frustrations, uh, inspiring tidbits of scholarship, and, uh, and and try to try to explain just what's going on when those of us that are you know like more more progressive Christians, why we think one we believe in the resurrection and what we mean by it is cooler, zestier, and bigger uh, than some of our more conservative friends who insist on video camera footage. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this conversation. It was inspired by Dom's lecture series on the historical Jesus, which which if you haven't watched, you can get. By donating anything between zero uh, and a million dollars, just go to crossandclass.com and uh, grab it up. If you say to yourself, whoa, Trip, I would love to experience some online learning hanging out with you. And I'm like, whoa, well, guess what? Thomas J. Ord and I are about to start a class called God After Deconstruction. We've created 10 different 30 to 40 minute videos that you could use in any setting alone or in a group. Uh, tackling 10 different topics of deconstruction. And then throughout April, we're going to have live streams. That's right. Live streams answering your questions. But we'll put the video and audio on the page so you don't have to join live. And you can join that by going to godafterdeconstruction.com. But last but not least, it's time to register for Theology Bear Camp. That's right. October 17th to 19th in Denver, Colorado. Over 500 nerds like yourself, 20 plus scholars, 20 plus God pods will all be hanging out live, interacting, having some zesty old fun. And uh, we want you to come. Go to theologybeer.camp. That's a URL, friends. Theologybeer.camp and grab your ticket. At the end of March, the ticket price goes up. So go ahead and get it right now. Uh, early bird style. You know what I mean? Anyway. fires and Uh-oh. oh there he comes we yeah. were making tons of jokes dom about you <laughs> you, told, you told me to hit f and i was effed okay <laughs> everything, everything disappeared so i'm not going to do that again <laughs> don't <laughs> oh head. man we've been making jokes about the resurrection and disappearing <laughs> jesus was with them and then he just yeah, disappeared. Took three, days, three days to get back which we <laughs> I'm going to close up this. I'd like to have as big a screen as I can. Well, the... Uh, um... <laughs> the question, what does a resurrected Dom look like? Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, Dom, did you come uh, bringing Adam and Eve with you, or did you just uh, ascend? No, I, no, I just have Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I, I have to say, y'all are quite the dynamic duo, so... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right. You can do anything. She plays Photoshop like a fiddle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, super excited to be here and uh, very glad to have Diana joining us for some resurrection fun. Um, I think with the three of us combined, uh, we're going to try to, you know, ruin our reputations as people that just hate the resurrection and Christianity and try to undermine it every Easter. Um, uh, surprisingly, uh, Dom. Dom had a whole lecture about it, and uh, and y'all sent some rather amazing questions. Uh, but as we've been doing in these uh, live Q and As, we we start with whoever our uh, our special third guest is, and the way they want to kind of talk about their relationship to Dom, his work, what we've been talking about, uh, and such. And when um, Dom and I had the idea of doing these live Q and As uh, with a, a different third friend, Diana was the person on both of our lists. That's no. how it happened. You know, like, oh, who? Oh, like Diana. Diana, yeah, well, Diana would be great. And then I said, well, you know, she's uh, having her little birthday celebration, so she didn't say yes as much. We had to lure her. And so with the power of just Dom and I being her friend and obviously sin, law, and death getting conquered, she, uh, you know, came out of the, uh, came out of the uh, fun uh, year-long celebration of her birth to... Uh, hang out with us. So Diana, I'm going to let you uh, let you take over 
how you want to kick things off and frame things. And then um, we'll get talking after Dom kind of responds. And I've got nice organized questions from everyone in the group. Okay. Well, um, I was thinking back about when I would have met Dom. And I don't actually remember the first time uh, that we met uh, Dom. But I I do know that it was through Marcus Borg. Yeah. And I had certainly been familiar with your work for quite a long time. Uh, Notably, when I was a professor at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, the job from which I was later, uh, should I say, fired, removed, kicked out, whatever it was. I I was in the religion department and there was this, I remember this one lunch that we had with religious studies majors and the chair of the department was Bob Gundry. I don't know if his, that's a name, you know, he is. Yeah, he was a Matthew scholar who got in a lot of trouble with the evangelical community for a commentary that he wrote on Matthew. Um, but he he literally hated the Jesus Seminar. I mean, he he would get to be like purple whenever he talked about it. And a big part of it, I was absolutely convinced, was that you all, and this would have been in the 90s, that you all were in the news so much mm-hmm. and and had gotten so much attention towards your work and your books were selling just like hotcakes on a national level. And um, so we were at this one lunch with the religious studies majors and he started attacking you and Marcus Bork. And I, I'm kind of ornery in certain ways. And as soon as that happened... After that lunch, I went down to the borders in Santa Barbara and I bought every book on the shelf by you and Marcus Borg. (laughs) And I decided that they had to be good if Bob Gundry hated them so much. (laughs) (laughs) And it's kind of of sad, Diana, because what we set out to do, let's be very clear, was public. So yeah, all this stuff that that our fellow scholars said, you're seeking publicity. Yeah, that's right. Not for ourselves, but for the integrity of what we're doing in private uh, discussions and conventions, in in articles that are lined with footnotes so no sane person would try to read them. We're going to tell you what we're doing. That's what we're doing. So it wasn't really, to be honest, which is that we had invented anything new, well, Doing it together maybe was a little bit new, but to do it publicly, that was it. Yeah, and and that, I think, made some people really upset because... It annoyed annoyed more people who would have agreed with us on, for example, if we wanted to discuss, did we think that Jesus taught the Our Father as in Matthew? That could be written and discussed, and nobody would raise an eyebrow, honestly, at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, anywhere else. But what we were doing was doing it publicly and we were breaking the seal of confession, which is, here's the deal, you people. You go into your learned societies and you do whatever you want and say whatever you want. You do not come out in the streets and scare the horses. (laughs) That's why we had opposition from the right wing, which was understandable, and the left wing ourselves. (laughs) So it's, it's very important to understand that there's a lot of people who don't want you to raise the questions, let alone answer them. But the questions are there. They don't go away. That's right. And the irony was, of course, I was back at that college to give a lecture in, I think, 19, oh no, 2020, just before COVID. It was one of the last lectures I gave before COVID was at your college. You're kidding. They actually invited you? Yes, I, it was a joint lecture with Santa Barbara, University of California, Santa Barbara. Oh, my God. So I may have got in, you know, under a different door of the tent or something. I'm not certain. It was a joint. And I was t- talking at Santa Barbara, too. I remember very clearly because it was the, the last one I did really before the COVID shut everything down. Well, that's amazing to me. And I mean, it, it literally was the subject of... Uh, you know, it, you, you were verboten, you, th- that that the Jesus seminar was just too far and that these particular scholars had 
were were really pushing the envelope of anything that an orthodox christian could possibly even want to engage yeah. and so so that was that was really my first like real attention to your work was the fact that my colleagues hated it and i and i didn't really like my colleagues so i figured i might like you <laughs> <You're> so right <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, so, so that piece had been there. And then I met Marcus along the way before I met you. And eventually he introduced the pair of us. And, and I went to, to bring that, bring that up because some of the worst trouble I have ever gotten into in public arguments has been defending you two around the issue of the resurrection. Um, I had a huge clash with um, Tony Jones of Emergent Christianity about Marcus's views of the resurrection. And then I had another big argument with Jim Wallace um, about some conversation that you and Marcus had with Jim Wallace about the resurrection. And Marcus used to talk about that up until about the day he died, about the misunderstanding in that conversation. And then when I've tried to defend um, the views that you present on social media, I've gotten in trouble. And in 2000. 19, I guess it would have been right before you were at Santa Barbara. Um, I got into a quarrel that was so substantial on Twitter that it got nicknamed Resurrection Gate. And I was canceled by hundreds and hundreds of people, including losing speaking engagements, okay. because all of a sudden this word was out around the whole of mainline church that Diana Butler Bass didn't believe in the resurrection. Yeah. And um, all of which was completely untrue, um, but nevertheless was made true by a weird quarrel on social media that was sort of kicked off yeah. by uh, my defense of you and Marcus. So yeah, but the- let's be very clear. There's lots of Christians and para-Christians, let's call them, or ex-Christians, but para-Christians, who are quite happy with Christmas. Because, you know, that's the birth of a baby and that's real. And, and Santa Claus, in any case... Is a, is a fair representative of gift giving and everything else. Now you come to resurrection. This is the great embarrassment for most people. You got Easter bunnies. Now, really, come on. I mean, is that the best we can do, even as a as a, a secularization, if you want to call it, or Easter eggs? So I'm going to start and force people to look at two facts, facts, not interpretations. We come to that in a minute. The first fact is that of all the events in Jesus' life, the most important one, which is the moment of the resurrection, the instant of the resurrection, the flash of light, if you want to think of it that way, is never described in the New Testament. That's a fact. I didn't make it up. In fact, it smothers you with the results and the consequences, and he's in Galilee, and he's in Jerusalem, he's all over the place appearing, but there are consequences. Not my idea. I didn't make that up. Where's the event itself? Who wants to describe it in the New Testament? That's the first fact. Second fact is because of that vacuum, I presume, the Western tradition, the Western Easter tradition, and the Eastern Easter tradition are radically different. Now, I didn't make that up. And I show you the evidence in what you're watching today. And tell me it's not there as Sarah and I were all over the place looking for it, and we found it everywhere we went, all over Eastern Christianity. Those are facts. I thought it was, I thought that that was stunning in your lecture, as a matter of fact. Um, (laughs) I I literally, when you said that the resurrection has to be part of the story for the historical Jesus scholar, I stopped the video, and I walked into the other room, and I said, Richard, you got to listen to this. (laughs) And and I said, I knew that Dom always thought that this was central and important. And then when you unfolded that, oh, I mean, for me, that was that was almost a revelatory moment when you pointed out that first fact. And I even thought about like how that compares to the transfiguration. 
because there we have another event that is fully explained um, in the Gospels. And it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a vision event. It's a, whatever it's, it's much like what you would expect the resurrection to be described at. Let me hold you on that, Diane. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to hear you reply to that. It is precisely an ascension. Jesus is up there. Who's with him? Moses and Elijah. What, why are those two? They didn't resurrect. They ascended. That's an ascension. They're up in heaven, as it were, the greeting. <laughs> they didn't die in the, in the previous story. Right. Well, Moses is a little tricky. When, when, if you're reading the, the account of Moses' um, death in, in Deuteronomy, and then in, in, but leave that aside for a moment. It's a, you can actually watch Mark. Let me focus on Mark 9. You can watch Mark change an ascension into a resurrection. Hmm. Up on the top of the, <laughs> the hill, if you will, you have an ascension. Jesus goes up, gorgeous, magnificently, to be greeted, of course, in heaven by two people already there, the greeting committee, as it were, who have ascended there. Then as you come down, they're told, don't tell anyone about this until the resurrection. Ah, so this is a preview, a teaser for the resurrection. Then if it's a resurrection, wait a minute. Let me ask the question that I ask all the time. Resurrection is a term and a concept. If you were a first century Jew, what did that term mean for you? Before we get into, do I think it was actual or literal or I believe in that you don't? Wait a minute. What did it mean if somebody said resurrection? Is that different from saying ascension? Hmm. And now the, now the questions start to really roll hard. Because the earliest thing you have in the New Testament, the earliest gospel, besides the gospel according to Paul, which is a gospel, is the gospel according to Q. Where's the resurrection in Q? Did he forget it? Did he just leave it out? He didn't get to it? Of course not. It's not in his theology. So now here we have the two earliest pre-gospels, gospels (laughs) before the four, the gospel according to Peter, the gospel according to Q, one is all over crucifixion and resurrection. The other doesn't have either of them. Uh, those are facts that require explanation. Right. Unless you simply dismiss them by saying, well, you know, we don't bother with Q or something like that. So those were for me the big question. What, what do I mean when I say resurrection? What did Paul mean when he says resurrection? Before I rush in to say, well, I, I don't know if it happened or not. Because I want to be clear for me, loud and clear. Ascension or resurrection for me are metaphors. A metaphor is a a way of seeing. And if people think that metaphors are unimportant, let let me risk using a modern metaphor. If the last election was stolen from from Trump or won by Biden, those are two metaphors for how to see reality. And if you live in one or the other, and if enough people live in the one or the other, we will change America and the reality will be different. Our metaphors real. Oh, they're the realest thing in the world. They create the world. So this debate is really real. I, I find it kind of, I mean, I, I can't hear it almost. It goes right over my head. Because metaphors are how we human beings create reality. And a bad metaphor dooms us. So be careful with your metaphors. And they're only words until you live them. (laughs) When you start living them, they're slowly creating reality. And at least if we're wise, we watch if it's working. And we try to say, yeah, that one isn't working. But what's the alternative? It's another metaphor, preferably one that doesn't destroy us. Anyway. You know, I, I just thought that um, all that the, the preface part of your lecture was all so very important, laying out those those 
but you're p- pointing out those facts about the Gospels, you know, is that it's just not there. And it, that made no sense. That makes no sense in the context of other stories that are there. Yeah. And so then, then it just sort of hangs there to, to use the very clever turn of phrase that you use as the great omission, which is lovely because everybody knows the great com- commission, yeah. um, but to use the great omission. And then to do that as the springboard and to say, hey, yeah, um, there are these metaphors. And I, th- I think that a lot of younger adults get tripped up on the language of metaphor because they think of metaphor and myth and sort of pretend. Um, I tend to just use the language of storytelling, you know, so rather than use those big M words, metaphor and myth, I'll just say the stories that we tell, we tend to believe or, you know, we tell them over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um I, agree. I, I avoid story. I'll tell you why. Oh, that's interesting. I want to hear why. I really do. I mean, not that I'm not doing it. Of course I'm doing it. But because right now we are being forced politically in this country to face that there is story and there is stories that are being used to disguise the truth. And then people say, well, what's truth? There are lies. Stories can lie. And it can be calculated lies. So, for example, if I'm looking at Matthew 1 and 2 about the flight into Egypt, I'm not happy, as some of my colleagues are, to avoid the issue by saying that's a story. Of course it's a story. So is the story that our last election was fraudulently stolen. That's a story. If two lawyers go into court, each tells a story. But one of those stories we know is true, and the only way we can calculate it is give 12 people a unanimous vote in life and death situations. So I, I, I don't want story as a sort of a, a kind of a cruise control to get you out of the problem of saying, I think this story actually happened, and these are the consequences. This is perfectly valid. This is a fiction <laughs> I'm nothing wrong with fiction. Jesus tells them all the time. They're called parables. I never use the term myth unless I'm talking about, say, two gods. Like if Venus, if Venus, if Venus sleeps with Mars <laughs> and makes love, not war. Okay, that's a myth. It's a powerful myth, by the way. <laughs> Make love, not war. But it's a myth because it's. it's but whenever I find Caesar, for example, stopping at the Rubicon in one story. And having a, 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 an old crone tell him, tell him, stop, stop, stop. And another story, story also, in which Caesar is told by a beautiful woman, come forward, come forward. Those are both parables. They're anti-parables to me. I don't want to call them myths. Because he did cross the Rubicon. <laughs> and so I, I want to restore parable as a, a much more dominant term whenever we're dealing with human beings, even if I'm a human being and I'm claiming a vision or anything else. I I call that a parable. If it's just all with heavenly beings or gods and goddesses, I would call that myth. So I'm careful with the language I use. And I, I ask people to understand that when Jesus wanted to say something important about the rule of God, he told stories, myths, fictions, definitely fictions. Nobody that I know thinks the good Samaritan is a real person. But (laughs) at the end of it, Luke says, go and do likewise. Oops. So you could live a parable. And that makes you think, well, how do I do it? So I should dress up as a Samaritan and then I'll get a place on the, no, I go up and down the Jerusalem Jericho road looking for Jews in a ditch. That's how I do it. You know, that's not true. Everyone knows that. So you have to think. So I would like, to, my language is very careful. It's parable. It's metaphor. Because we have, to, we have to remember democracy is not a fact. It's a way of seeing it. And if we ain't living it, it ain't happening. And if we stop living it, it's gone. So I see huge political implications of this for the life and future, say, of America and other Mm -hmm. countries. 
So if we continue with that line of thinking, um, how do you adjudicate between metaphors? which I think you're trying to do in your lecture. There are se- certainly seem to me to be a preference yeah. for the Eastern metaphor over the Western metaphor. So, 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 so I'm, I, I want to hear you talk about that. And yes, you're quite right. We have to judge the metaphors. The other example I use is the 1930s, the New Deal and the Third Reich, both metaphors to solve the same problem in a way. The New Deal is one, and they were both tried. Now, it took a while to see maybe which was more lethal for the human race. So we have to adjudge the metaphor, and constantly. We can't say, oh, we got it now, we're home freed. Let's check 10 years from now. So let me take those two examples. One criterion is, I think, actually, the Eastern one, the Eastern, let me use a, a neutral term, exaltation. I, I don't want to say resurrection. The, the exaltation of Jesus in the Eastern tradition of the Eastern Church is far closer to what's in the New Testament. I think if Paul had been challenged by the Corinthians, yes, who said to me, okay, you're always talking about crucifixion. We know about crucifixions. We've seen them. This resurrection stuff, what do you mean by that? Draw us a picture. I think he'd have drawn something far more Eastern than Western. And the Western, of course, suits us fine. It's, it's straight out of the <laughs> wallpaper of the Mediterranean. What do great people do? Mostly men, by the way. What do great men do? They ascend into heaven. They're taken up by the gods. Romulus for the, the, for the Romans, uh, um, Moses for the Greeks. So Jesus would ascend. Oh, we, we love that. We would, may not believe it, but it suits our master story. Great males ascend to the gods. Oh, yeah. Great stuff. Now, over here, you have this other story about death. Hades is is a place of death. It's not a place of punishment. There's no punishment there. It's just like a great big uh, condominium complex underneath the earth. And good old, you know, Hades, who's who's both the, the... the, the, pers- the personification of the place, but he's also the, the gatekeeper. It's nothing personal, you know. He just takes you in and won't let you out. You don't, don't pick on him. He's just got a job. He's the gatekeeper. He's not evil, but he's big and he's strong. And he's got everyone in there. So if you want to summarize it, he's got Adam and Eve in there. That's everyone. That's the human race in the biblical tradition. Now, here's the challenge to think about it. Jesus has been executed. Jesus is the Messiah Christ. He's been executed. He's not been lynched, by the way. He's not been run over by a chariot, you know, bad day. He's been executed, I'm thinking like, like Paul. The Messiah has been executed publicly, legally, 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 yeah. by the greatest empire the world has ever known, which vaunts its legality, its law and order. That's what it tells us why we take over you barbarians. We're liberating you into law. And it crucified the Messiah. And Paul, Paul can only explain it. This is the mystery which God has hidden since the beginning of the world. That when the Messiah comes, the state will execute him legally. (gasps) I mean, it, it leaves them speechless. You can see it at the beginning of 1 Corinthians. He's not speechless because Paul is never speechless. But, but then, wait a minute. Then the Pharisaic vision is of the resurrection. It's not the same as ascension. That's what I call the wallpaper of the Mediterranean world. Jews, Romans, Greeks, all agreed people could ascend it to heaven if they're important enough. But then along comes Paul and his Pharisaic option. Only the Pharisee, all Jews didn't believe this, was that there was going to be a great big cosmic justification of the world. Okay, people get away with it now, it's even. But at the end of time, end of time, the Pharisees, not talking about Messianic Pharisees, Pharisees, believed there's going to be a great 
big <laughs> accounting. Put it in my language, there will be cosmic accountability. He will talk about everyone who's ever lived will rise from the dead. We say, oh, come on, you know, what about the cannibals? And we mock it. It's so easy to mock. <laughs> the Athenians did it according to the Acts. But what's been claimed by the Pharisaic vision is there is a final cosmic responsibility, universal accountability, and consequences. And I find that absolutely valid. And I don't find it waiting at the end of time first. I find it operational every day. So when I come to take resurrection, I don't use it as meaning, well, Jesus is back. You know, he's around all the time. He didn't go away. Easter happens every year. There's always springtime. Things. None of that rubbish. It's a claim about universal accountability of the human race. And only the Pharisees had it. The Sadducees, who were perfectly happy with the status quo, no need for that. Everything is just fine and dandy. Of course, it's the Pharisees who appeal to the ordinary people, by the way, who are claiming there will be, even at the end of time, there will be at least somehow, someday, somewhere, universal accountability for what we do. So, I see that as the vision of the Pharisee that Paul takes as a Pharisee. And then he combines that as a messianic Pharisee, if you want to use that term, a Christic Pharisee, with the crucifixion of, of the Messiah, of Jesus the Messiah Christ. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is the start of the resurrection. He'd never say Jesus has ascended. No, that's, that could happen to anyone <laughs> So resurrection for me has a very specific meaning, both in the first century and in the 21st century. It is about human accountability and what we don't get away with, not because of divine punishments or any of that language, that, but because of human consequences. So I find a huge amount forsaken the resurrection, and I believe in it more probably than I believe in anything else, because I see the effects every evening on the news. How can you not believe in it? <laughs> Dom, um, one of the, there are a couple of questions around this. I want to try to uh, say back a different way. Okay. Um, the kind of a number of the elements you raised. Um, uh, it, 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 it sounds like the part of the picture is um, ascension, uh, isn't an actual answer to the theological question um, Jesus raises in the kingdom of God and in his ministry, what he said and did and endures, doesn't raise a question where ascension's a solution because the proclamation of the kingdom of God comes out of an eschatological hope for the Jewish people that their ongoing experience of the injustice of civilization using the language that you've raised, mm -hmm. that, that empire upon empire has had their foot on their throat demonstrating uh, that this cross-building power rules history and will continue to rule it. And then uh, the, the faith of a people who were given Torah, were visited by the prophetic voice, who insist that there's one good God of justice that brought creation into the world and will be revealed in its history, ask the question, well, where are you? What's going on? Look at this situation. And one of the responses— um, that you get in this kind of apocalyptic imagination, this eschatological vision, is that God will come and will bring about uh, a, a transformation of history where the character of the good God of Israel is revealed in the material reality of God's good creation. Okay. And that gap between the character of God and the injustice of history raises a theological question mm -hmm. that into it, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is here and coming. Yeah. You can participate in it, and yet uh, we're, it, it has yet to arrive. And you have that framing, and to me, that like the moment he dies cross dead, uh, short of the resurrection, um, the, like he becomes one more witness against the goodness of God. And so the resurrection is an answer to that question that the asc ascension isn't, because the resurrection is not just 
Jesus has a comeback, yeah. but that Jesus, and this is a, explained symbolically and metaphor, that brings Adam and Eve out, that the good God of all creation is redeeming all creation. Yeah. And if you, it, it, to me, like that shift, and then it makes sense. You've spent time um, in other of our conversations going like, yeah, so Paul's sitting there going, um, without the resurrection, this whole thing's in vain, but the ascension doesn't fix the vain part. The resurrection does. It's only when Jesus is a, or the resurrection of Jesus is a revelation of all those that died, cross dead's future in the life of God, that it becomes good news again. Okay. And it's just like Jesus. It's not good news that you sit on the sideline for. It's one you're actually invited to make reality by giving yourself to it metaphorically okay. using your language to become a people where you share, say, the mind of Christ that uh, is a counter to civilization's imperial conquest that has a different relationship with violence. It doesn't build it for its enemies, but be but bears it. Like to me, that like part of what you open up in this is the stakes that only the resurrection answers the theological question. And then when you go to read Paul, that's exactly what he's obsessed with. Yeah. It's not the tomb story doesn't give an answer to the theological question that a Pharisaic, uh, a Pharisaic thinker is going to ask. Yeah. And, and that is, uh, and let anyway. me be careful. no, let me be careful about the language. I have no problem with the word eschatological because it means the vision of a just world. Apocalyptic bothers me because there's a postponement there. And the, the crucial issue for me in the Torah and in the prophets and in the wisdom section, I cannot see the idea that God's going to do it for us. I can't see it. I see it all over the place. Is God's going to do it with us? <laughs> and that's and that's one of the contrasts you drew yes. in lecture two between Jesus right. and John the Baptist. That's the crucial thing for him. Now I understand. I understand how somebody, I really do, how a poor battered people confronted with one more empire, even more powerful than anything they've seen before, will finally say, Oh God, come and do it for us. I'm Irish. I do understand. Though, though sometimes we keep trying. But the crucial thing for me is the difference between an inter, interventionist God and a participatory God, because I see Jesus's right. rule of God calling for participation. It's not like it's here, do join it. No, it's not here unless you join it. Then I see Paul saying exactly the same thing. His idea of resurrection is not, it happened to Jesus, isn't that lovely? And maybe if you believe in it, it might happen to you. No. <laughs> Again, I see participation. So I see a continuity from Genesis 1, particularly Genesis 1, all the way through. I, I do see a point, and I understand it, around 150, where certain of the sages of Israel, I think, lost their nerve, lost maybe even their hope, maybe even lost their faith that if we just pray and wait and hope, God will do it for us. I do not find that in continuity. I find, I understand it. I really do. It's like, what can we do? What can we do? So you kind of, you don't quite give up. You wait for God. And it's not nothing, but it's never the future that I see. So that's the crucial thing for me, to be very, very careful about the apocalyptic imagination. Boy, that's a really beautiful and fine divide right there. Um, because I think so much of contemporary Christianity mixes up the an eschatological hope and an apocalyptic hope. Um, and I never, I don't think I ever really thought of that as going back to the resurrection. I have always sort of blamed it more on the, the book of Revelation, but it goes a long way to explain why, say, liberal Protestants and social justice Catholics can have a sort of highly developed eschatological, um, incarnational sort of theology, whereas evangelicals who are much more taken by the apocalyptic view um, will emphasize 
the power and the warrior God returning the mm -hmm. ascension, um, and then, you know, have developed in the last 200 years, the, all those ideas about the rapture and the return of Christ. Mm -hmm. So, so that's a, that's a really interesting way of trying to, trying to understand this, this division, pushing back all of these centuries to the central action of the gospel. Yeah. And there's huge work to be done done here. Once you, once you get to see this, then you have to ask yourself, was it Paul? Let me put it in, in blunt language. Did Paul invent resurrection? Without Paul, would it have been the ascension of Jesus? Romulus arose for the Romans, and, uh, Mo, and now here we have a new founder, and he has risen up to God. And what would have happened? Our question, like, would Paul's theology have changed if Jesus had done everything he did, miracles, parables, everything, and died in his bed at home in Nazareth after a long life of holiness? Would Paul's theology have been the same? I'm not saying it would been ruined, but it would not have been the same. It, it is crucial for Paul. You can see it in first in the frames of First Corinthians. He begins with the crucifixion as it ends with the resurrection. If the Messiah had not been executed by Rome legally, then I don't think Paul would have said, in effect, what price law and order? This is law and order? This is what it looks like? It's like us today looking at the Supreme Court, to put it very bluntly, and saying, this is law? And we, we live under it. This is law. And we live by law. So is the function of law the obstruction of justice? Is that the great revelation? The function of law is the obstruction of justice? Could that be right? And is that why we invent law so we kind of can get away from? And then we can say, well, it's legal. So I see huge questions. And I can't any longer distinguish even the first century from the 21st century. I have great trouble, <laughs> honestly. I mean, I'm... That's I'm because you just turned 90. That may be <laughs> <laughs> <It's> the apocalypse. <laughs> no, no, sunsets can be gorgeous. No. <laughs> it, it, I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist. I know. It, it really has, has to do, do, I think, with... I'm not looking for relevance any longer. I'm trying to control the relevance, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't not see it. I didn't go looking for it. Uh, as, you, as you well know, we, we were just simply doing the board cross and pilgrimage across Turkey looking for Paul. We weren't looking for resurrection or Eastern Christianity or anything else. We were just kind of minding our own business in, in Pauline, among Pauline ruins. And then all of a sudden, we started seeing this thing, literally. It wasn't on the agenda. I didn't know about it. I mean, I kind of had a vague idea there was a different thing over there, but, you know, it was just something else. It was a revelation for me that everywhere you went, across wherever Eastern Christianity had been, and that was all across Europe, of course, it, it had receded, as it were, but it was originally, there was just one Christianity, neither East nor West, you have a totally different vision. And it's still really the epiphany, just epiphanizing itself out, that this there's huge implications here. Can I back up and ask you just another question about Paul? Um, that was a very provocative thing that you just said. Did Paul invent the resurrection? I've kind of wondered that same question myself in the light of all that Twitter argument that I was in, it threw me back into the Gospels and rereading Paul. And um, I'm curious as to whether, whether or not you think Paul, that his invention, as it were, his, his construction of this metaphor, uh, because, of course, Paul's before the Gospels, so he doesn't have those stories, those accounts available to him, just to make that clear to the people who are listening. Um, so, Paul is telling a story that no one has the, the familiar images for, and he's trying to tell it as a preacher and as a teacher. 
do you think it contains both of the elements that become Western and Eastern Christianity? Or do you think as well that it sounded a little bit like from way my ear was hearing it, that you think Paul was leaning much more toward what will become the Eastern metaphor at, rather than the, the Western one? Oh, yes, I do think. I think Paul, if he, when he, as I said, tried to imagine myself if the Corinthians finally poked him. And, you know, they're good Platonists, <laughs> Messianic Platonists, and this whole resurrection is a little bit weird. Now, ascension, they've no trouble with. The whole Mediterranean accepts that people can ascend to the gods or to God. It's, it's as I said, it's the, the wallpaper of the Mediterranean. I might believe in your one, but you can't tell me it can't be done. And Justin Martyr, that's his basic argument, that after all, you people claim that your emperors have descended to the gods. Why do you pick on us when we say that Jesus has ascended to the gods? He said he doesn't say resurrection. Now, here the evidence that's striking me is this. The more I study Q, and as a theology in itself, not some kind of a truncated drawer and to put to which you put little bits that don't fit with Mark, Matthew, and Luke, as a real theology in which wisdom, as we know, comes down to earth. Its, it's uh, representatives are John and Jesus, so two witness to it. And they're rejected. I, I can't find a glimmer of resurrection theology in there. And I don't mean it's not there. I mean it's not needed. And I'm not even sure there's ascension theology. There certainly is a Jesus parousia. <laughs> I was almost say coming back. I want to avoid that. But if you said to, if you said to somebody in the Q community, well, where is Jesus right now? Would they have said, well, he's ascended into heaven pending return? I don't know. So I look at them. I can't find resurrection in there. And on the other hand, the very earliest image of what we call the resurrection is an ivory piece from around the year, I think it's 400 or something, in which you have down here the women at the tomb and everything else, and you have Jesus ascending with God's hand reaching down to give him a <laughs> help up into heaven. So the earliest image we have, the earliest, earliest image we have of, looks like resurrection because the tomb and all that stuff is there, He's ascending the Mount of Olives, as it were, up to God, and God's hand is meeting him. So, I mean, it's a huge question, and it is a question. I don't mean it's a rhetorical question. It's a question to somebody to do a PhD dissertation on, PhD. Is, could Paul have invented it? If it wasn't for Paul, would we have worked with ascension? Christianity wouldn't have gone away. And would that have become the dominant image? And I don't know how it would have been worked out. But I see lots of evidence that it would. And a final question is even when we get into 1 Corinthians 15, Paul knows about the visions. He's had, he's had his own vision. But here's the question. I once asked Tom Wright in a debate with this, and it's still the question I'd asked. And that was almost 20 years ago. If you imagine Easter Sunday morning and for the moment, allow everything. Tomb is found empty. Visions all over the place. Please allow that for the moment. Why didn't they conclude immediately to ascension? That's the obvious conclusion from an empty tomb in the Greco-Roman tradition. If the tomb is empty, it's either grave robbery or the person has ascended. Those are their two options. We know that from a novel, a Greek novel. So where did the resurrection come in? Did it come in immediately whenever the... I was ascension there first, then Paul, as a Pharisee, as a Messianic Christic Pharisee, says resurrection, and that changes everything. Then everyone starts using resurrection, but I'm looking at that Western tradition, and I'm not seeing resurrection. I'm seeing Jesus ascending, and they can call it resurrection all they want, but he's just coming out of the tomb, and he's going up. Maybe he stops to have a chat <laughs> along the way, but he's going up, and there ain't no Adam and Eve, and this is a different world. It's a different metaphor. Maybe you prefer that metaphor. Maybe it's a more Western metaphor because it's all about a man, a man ascending, as it were. 
but it's a different metaphor. So that's where I am. I, I'd like to discuss whether that verb egairo, which we translate automatically as resurrection, it just means up, getting up. It's not the same as anastamy and anastasis and all those ones pretty much go back to the Maccabees and they mean resurrection. And that's, that's the vision that you have of the Maccabean martyrs. They're not just ascending. They're part of the great big cosmic justification of resurrection. And what does Paul use it in 1 Corinthians 15? It's uh, the, the verb of God. Well, he does two things. First of all, when he tells the stuff that's been passed over to me, he uses the verb egairo, which we translate as resurrection, of course, in that context. But then what's crucial after that is that Paul makes this argument, and it's an extraordinary argument. If there is no general resurrection, there cannot be a Jesus resurrection. But say, wait, wait a minute, Paul, couldn't there be a resurrection just for Jesus? Special privilege. Paul would say, but it can't be a personal resurrection. It can't be an individual resurrection. I'm a Pharisee. There's only a general resurrection for everyone. But then how, how can there be a resurrection for Jesus parable? You could hear the first Corinthians. Ah, it's the start of the general resurrection, says Paul. That's the breakthrough. Otherwise, we're talking ascension. You cannot know no meaning in the first century of the term resurrection is that happened to one person. It's like if you and I use the word like uh, the Senate, that's not the same as a senator. It, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's a corporate word. It's a, it's a communal word. It's a universal word. So he has to argue that if there's no Jesus resurrection, there's no general resurrection, no general, no Jesus. They stand or fall together. Now, if you focus on that, and it's, it's in First Corinthians. You're looking at the heart of Paul. You're hearing his heart beating, as it were. Because the general resurrection and the Jesus resurrection stand and fall together. And they both link, of course, with the crucifixion of the Messiah, the legal crucifixion of the Messiah. Otherwise, you say, well, why should it start with Jesus? You know, he's a holy person. Fine, Paul, I understand that. But why should the general resurrection start with Jesus? Why couldn't it start with any other sainted person? And there's a lot of them around. Other people died on a Roman cross, Paul. 2,000 died in the year 4 BCE, 500 a day. In five, why is Paul? Because he was, as I believe, says Paul, the Messiah. And then when the Messiah came, the state executed him legally. I, I can't see Paul's theology saying any other way. The two things, and that's where I see, of course, in the Western, in the Eastern tradition, sorry, it's crucially important that Jesus carries that cross. Then when he, when he gets finally to be a two-handed equal opportunity resurrector, somebody kind of, very often the angels are carrying the cross. Somebody, they can't disappear. Now, it, it will eventually. Eventually the cross will be gone. The cruciform halo stays again and again. The wounds show. You see, wouldn't the wounds heal eventually? You know, no, they never heal, as it were, in imagery or in in um, Christian theory, th theology or in visions. The medieval Christ who appears to a sister in her convent is going to have wounds. You see, which, yes, after a thousand years, wouldn't they kind of heal up? No, <laughs> he is always the crucified one who resurrected. So I think that's the heart of Christianity. Once that is lost, Christianity is still hanging around as a habit, like a custom. You know, like decorations for Christmas, they're fine, no problem with them. But they have no living reality. They're just like a, like a custom, like Halloween costumes. You know, they're fun, but they're not serious. They don't affect the future of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah, there are a couple of questions around... Um, the participatory language in Paul, okay. like thinking of his framework of resurrection um, that you've been describing, um, what do you think is entailed uh, or he's imagining um, eschatologically with things like 
uh, we're baptized into Christ in Christ, like all the kind of we're in Christ collectives or sharing the mind of Christ. And these kind, th- this kind of language w- w- is, do we do a similar uh, move to his participatory language for the body of Christ in the church that we do with uh, it kind of muting what's going on by substituting ascension uh, in for resurrection? Well, yeah, his language is absolutely, his, his favorite word is in Christ. You think, shouldn't it be by Christ? I mean, if it's a vicarious atonement, then it's all done by Christ, whether you're in the, So in Christ is the giveaway, by the way. Um, everywhere I look in Paul, I find that language. Now, when he imagines baptism, he imagines you dying with Christ. We say, well, I mean, that's no way to get a community going. Let's all die with Christ. No, 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 no. Christ was killed. Christ was executed. He died to Rome by Rome. What you are doing is you are dying, says Paul, to Rome. The law and order normalcy of Rome, their values, hierarchy, control, and everything else, kill them. You are dying, literally, to those values. That's why when when you have those first, um, (laughs) what do we term, I was going to say, baptismal bases, baptismal graves, they're dug into the ground. We can see them all over the place when finally baptistries are are available in the 4th, 5th, 6th century. They're all over the place. They're dug into the ground, are built up on the ground like sarcophagi, so the baptizand goes down in and dies and comes up. And you think, well, that's, isn't that lovely symbolism? It's like a new life. <laughs> yeah. It's also treason. You know, you have professionally, professedly abjured the basic values of civilization. Now, you know, maybe you don't think of that. Maybe it doesn't make you um, violent or anything else, but that's what you've done. That's why the language that Paul uses in Rome, it's about dying to, dying with. It's not an invitation. Let's all get crucified and be good Christians. No, <laughs> there's no way to start a movement. But yes, it, it is possible. But what he's after is participating in the death of Jesus by Roman values, to Roman values, and as you know for me, Rome is simply civilization and a toga. <laughs> it's just, if, if, if the Romans wore, you know, let's think male, if the Romans wore suit and ties, that would be just a different mode of civilization. You know, I think I'm really getting this. It, 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 this is making more sense than anything else I've thought about in a long time. In the fact that there's the argument, of course, between whether it's a literal body or a spiritual resurrection. And for uh, I've written pieces about this and I've preached sermons about this, that it's actually a spiritual body yeah. that Paul is talking about. So whatever the body is, that is the subject of Paul speculating on whatever happened on Easter morning. Um, it isn't a body like a flesh and it's not a resuscitated body. No. And and so, but it is still a body. And the way that you just described that is participation actually is a, a a body. Yeah. You, you talked about it as the church. Yeah. And so the church is the body uh, that becomes the body in effect of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And it, and what you were just saying is that functionally baptism, you, you're renouncing Rome's hold on your physical body. Yes. Yes. That's and right. so, in effect, you are you are killing your physical body by being a traitor to the empire, and you are rising up on the other side of baptism. You're coming out of death on the other side that death on the other side of baptism to a new life, and it's through this this spiritual body you're taking on, your body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit, we're told, Mm -hmm. that you become part of 
this thing that we refer to as the mystical body of Christ, this this community of liberation, this com- community of anastasis. Yeah. Um, and so, so, so wow. Yes. That, that just escapes the whole spiritual yeah. versus literal juvenile argument it, <laughs> about the resurrection. It's irrelevant. And in one sense, I think we've said this before, Trip. it's not just that we, we make the wrong argument. We calculatedly, we calculatedly make the wrong argument to avoid the right one. I, I'm, you know, it's, if somebody makes a mistake, let's say you have an accountant and your accountant makes mistakes. And if they're honest mistakes, sometimes it should be in his favor, sometimes in yours. If all mistakes are in somebody else's favor, they ain't mistakes. They're calculations. So I think we're, we're, we're trying to get away again and again from the participation. Because the participation means we, we have stuff to do and you can get in trouble doing stuff. Everyone that I see in the Roman world understood that when people died, they had to have some kind of a body. Otherwise, how would you recognize them if you went down to visit them? When when Aeneas went down to visit his father and Jesus in Hades, how did he know him? How did he pick him out? When when um, uh, Hector appeared to Aeneas and tell him, "Get out of Troy! <laughs> the Greeks are coming! The Greeks are coming!" How did he recognize him? Because he was all bloody. He had the wounds of what had been done to, done to him, dragged around the, the walls of Troy. So they had some kind of a body. Now, if you poked them, as, as they did to Paul, and said, well, what kind of a body is it? No, nah, it's not the type of body that Luke has where you really come back from the dead and have a nice meal. No, nah, no. But if the body goes, then justice goes, because justice is about bodies. So, yes, th- that is what is at stake there. And that's why the debate was, well, you're quite right, a spiritual body, it's a, it's a redone body. But if you take it away and say, well, it's really a spirit, then you've, everything has drifted off into heaven. And there's no cost to it. And there's no meaning to it. And it's just lovely, as we said. But all of these do come out. We're trying to understand seriously what resurrection means. And it, it kind of appalls me that somebody gets some it all up to say you don't believe in it. Because the truth would be, if I was being unkind, and I'm never unkind, no, you don't, and you, dear friend, I'm not talking to you, don't believe in the resurrection because what I see you believing in is not the resurrection in any sense that I understand the word. It might be at very best an ascension at very best. But that's not what I'm talking about. So in effect, then, the justice piece, which is the piece that Jim Wallace and I have argued yep. about on occasion, is actually a cornerstone in the participation in the body of Christ. Yes. Is that if we are part, if we are participating in that body, the spirit body, as Paul refers to it all through his letters, then we are actually putting our bo- our physical bodies at risk against the empire for the vision and dream of God. Yes, because I don't like the term the mystical body. I've, we are not the mystical I understand body. That. We're the physical body of Christ. We're the arms that are operational, the eyes, the ears, the, the feet. We're, we're stuff doing stuff. Mystical, yes, we're, we're united with Christ, you could say mystically, but functionally as well. Let, let me go back to Jim Wallace. Uh, it, Marcus and I, we, uh, we had a, a, a conference at, at uh, Trinity and we spent the whole days together agreeing on all, everything. We were boring ourselves. We were in so much agreement because we never raised the issue of was it literal or metaphorical, but what we should do, how to live it. Now, that evening at dinner, I said, we, we, I think we knew another well enough. We weren't going to get into a fight because I wasn't certain. Jim, how do you think it is that you take the resurrection literally and Marcus and I take it metaphorically, I use that term, but yet we agreed for 
two or three days on all the implications of it. How is that possible? And he said, well, there is this big difference. You wouldn't die for a metaphor. And Marcus and I almost said it, honestly, without looking at one another. We wouldn't die for anything else. I, I remember saying, well, if I was a soldier, I wouldn't die for a piece of land between Canada and Mexico. I might die for my homeland. And that's a way of seeing it. If I don't see it as my homeland, then I don't care. So I honestly don't think Jim knew what I was saying. I knew what he was saying. If it wasn't literal, you wouldn't die for it. And I knew that we were passing one another. But, you know, basically we spent the whole day agreeing. Now, I want to be very careful because you might say, well, then it doesn't matter. Well, I think it does matter in the long run. I don't think you can take a very fundamentalist, literalist theology and add on justice and you're, you're back in the New Testament. I don't think that works in the long haul, but that's me. Do you, you know, one of the, um, now Dom, I'll just say I'm, I have not been nice when those accusations have come to me and proceeded to explain to them uh, that um, unless one is orienting and giving their finitude into the world towards the material participation with the coming of all that was resurrected through the uh, life of God in Christ, then they don't believe in the resurrection. And then to believe the resurrection is to be, it is to be working with your finitude to practice it. That is the like to affirm the resurrection is to enact it, uh, and and as you enact it, you participate in the hope that all creation. You might even say, Dom, that sin, law, and death become subject to the Son, Son to the Father, so that God is all in all. And yeah. you know, and that that might be what without it, our faith is in vain. And then so, to me, part of it though that shows up, and this might just be as you know, because I'm a philosopher. Um, I really think um, the epistemology of modernity uh, has equipped a large number of Christians in the present to come up with nerdy reasons to ignore the challenge of the resurrection or to think they're defending it by defending ascension. Yeah. That they've so internalized a modern vision of the world um, that that what is special about the resurrection is that a that that the world is wholly autonomous and separate from God. And it's really cool when God breaks in, breaks yeah. all the rules, intervenes, fixes something, raises something, does something really sweet. And now the whole truth of everything in our faith is based on defending these, uh, uh these break-ins of right. God into the world. And I just think to myself, um, uh, you only ask that question if you have failed to read scripture uh, where God is where we live, move, and have our being. Mm -hmm. the, the presence of the divine is not the variable running through Scripture. It's the participation of the faithful to God, right? Like, do you bless Abraham and Sarah to do what? Be a blessing for the world, to make God's reality present through their own faithfulness. What were the prophets calling Israel to do? To actually, like, do what? Reveal the character of God through how they enact and relate to the immigrants, the poor, and, like, not, like, I don't know, create weapons and start selling them. And that was Solomon's promise problem, inventing debt slavery so he can now have economic exploitation and he becomes the new Pharaoh. Like to me, there's a sense yeah. that modernity uh, has so been internalized into our mind that we then read scripture and think that the truth it's getting at is the same thing that happens under a microscope. And then we either defend it um, or, or it's just fake. And that, that, like, that's the gap that I have, not with like really conservative people, but when you're talking to someone where you're like, yeah, yeah, but for you and I, Jim, uh, affirmation of the resurrection entails, right? Um, like his beautiful new book, The White Christian Gospel, right? It's looking at the historic relationship of the church in America to white supremacy, imperial domination system, and calling it out with the teachings of Jesus and Paul inviting us to participate in a different way of being in the world. And I'm like, yes, that's called yep. the invitation to practice resurrection. And then he's going to be like, well, you know, well, the camera or yep. blah, blah, blah. And to me, I, I haven't figured out how to just go, 
I, I, I don't think the enlightenment gets to tell me <laughs> yep. the terms of my faith. <laughs> yeah. And it's not personal against you. If you need to, if you need something that I find a bit magical and weird, um, that's fine. But it has nothing to do with us orienting our, our, uh, orienting our own existence uh, towards resurrection, seeking yeah. to participate it, participate resurrection separately. Um, and the good news like becomes good when the body of Christ does it. I don't it's anyway, I, I just think modernity has yeah. made stupid people <laughs> and the they man, don't know how to read the Bible. The man, Amen. Amen. <laughs> remember that Ireland never had an enlightenment. We we had the British and we found them very enlightening. <laughs> True, we never had an enlightenment. We were busy doing other stuff called survival. But um I think we have to take seriously the thought behind it. It's not enough to say, well, as long as we all agree on what we have to do, yes, it's better than not, <laughs> of course. But I don't think that's how we do the, the long haul. Anyway. Well, you know, Dom, when you say that, it, 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 it makes me think about the damage that can actually happen with that trajectory over the longer term and i think that that's one of the things <laughs> we were talking about jim we should get him on and have him yeah. Yeah. try to argue this point but i i think that you know for jim he felt like that was really he feels like that's so important that is nest a bodily resurrection the physicality of the resurrection is necessary to taking care of the bodies of the poor the oppressed yes. etc that's and he and he would argue that it didn't come from the Enlightenment, even though I, I do think that his thought is shaped very much by the Enlightenment. And the, the, this whole conversation we're having spirit versus body and stuff is it has been reframed by the Enlightenment in ways that haunt us. And so so I think what is not recognized is that I can sit here in this conversation and say, yes. I absolutely am convinced that God has this dream of participatory justice, of liberation, of the lifting up of the whole of the human race, of of the 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 leading us toward an an evolutionary point where peace is the primary goal and 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 practice of of creation. I I actually actually believe all that. I believe it to my core. And part of the reason I believe it and can believe that the resurrection is part of that is the way that we've all been explaining this story today. If you think that the resurrection is solely a scientific truth based on a bodily, you know, sort of thing, this ascending body of Jesus, it's just as easy to reject it as it is to hold on to what Jim has done. Yeah. I mean, Jim is a very faithful steward of that narrative in his mm-hmm. tradition. As as mm-hmm. Trip just points out, his new book is beautiful about that. I love his new book about it. Yeah. But there are also millions and millions and millions of people who have let go of that narrative mm-hmm. because they find it to be fantastic fantastical and yeah. magical and bear no relationship to any reality whatsoever. Yeah. As you may have noticed, I put behind me the two images from the the Caragas from Sir Walter's Museum in in Baltimore. It's possible, surely, one one way maybe we can get through this. It's certainly possible to argue about the Western tradition. I can imagine it literally. I can imagine Jesus coming out of the tomb. I can. I may not be able to push it very hard. Tell me how you could possibly take the Eastern vision literally. I don't know how to do it. Jesus looks like a real person. He's got the wounds and all the rest of it. It looks like we're talking about Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, crucified. But he's taking Adam and Eve. Adam looks a little bit, you know, long bearded, old. Eve is, Eve is quite gorgeous, usually. She's the mother of the living, so she's beautiful. And he's getting them by the wrists and he's taking them out of the place of death. I do not know how to take that literally, but I know exactly how to take it metaphorically. The only thing that will save our species from extinction is non-violent resistance. That's the Jesus, I think. He was crucified <laughs> legally, but not for doing nothing. 
It wasn't that Pilate was having a bad day. Pilate sized him up as a nonviolent rebel. If he was violent, there'd been 12 crosses up there, or 11 or however you want to count Judas. There'd be 13 crosses up there. He crucified Jesus as the leader of a nonviolent tumult among the people, to use the Roman language, stirring up the people, which we call activists, stir up the people. So Jesus was crucified for nonviolent resistance to Rome. Pilate was not having a bad day, and it wasn't done by jealousy or anything else. It, the only question we have to ask about Jesus is why, is why he got away with it so long, either in Galilee or when he got to Jerusalem, why he even made a week, uh, mostly a week. So that's what we have to ask about Jesus. Then we have to ask about the Eastern tradition. How is it possible to take that literally? I don't know how to do it. I do know how to do the Western one. In fact, Luke kind of does it for us. He, Jesus comes out of the tomb. He calls it resurrection, but Jesus can eat. He's a regular body. Um, and he chats with people. And then he goes off. So it's kind of resuscitation pending ascension. That's Lucan theology, the, the way I see it. Now, there's, there is that story, of course, of the Emmaus, which really is against the whole thing, because there Jesus sort of is Jesus, and he's, he's, he's the stranger who you t invite in for the meal, and then, then Jesus is there, then he's gone. Oh, yeah, that's not Lucan theology. That's Lucan being a good historian and keeping in something he doesn't probably agree with. So I think if we focus a little bit on the Eastern one, we're going to find a lot of the problems and questions with the Western one simply disappearing before our eyes. Hmm. Um, w one thing, just because I know we need to wrap up soon, I'll let Diana ask the last question, um, is there's, a, uh, there's also a whole metaphysical layer to this entire discussion. Um, and there are a number of comments in the side about the relationship between thinking spiritually or metaphysically about the resurrection or physically. Um, I just say, just like reading the Bible has a whole lot of philosophical a prioris uh, that get brought in, some examined and some not. Um, debates around the resurrection have a host of them that are connected to divine action. Um, and uh, so sometimes theologians uh, argue against particular visions of ascension or physical resurrection under a certain kind of interventionist framework, because that then leaves God ethically culpable every time God didn't act that way. And, and, uh, the, and history like full mm -hmm. of more deaths where God set by, uh, and didn't act. Um, and that's just like one layer of it, right? So, and yes. if you're interested in it, Diana and Phil Clayton and I had a long conversation about how, how that plays out uh, theologically, you can all go check out. Um, and if there are other questions around it that come back up later, email me. It's not hard to get uh, me and Phil back to, to talk to like do the uh, use, say, the resurrection and lay out all the, the ways different metaphysical assumptions, how you understand naturalism, because there are theological reasons people argue against literalist interpretations um, that are just about what it ends up saying about God's character. Not because uh, yeah. you you uh, you know you're you're like oh I hate the Bible and I, you don't believe it. It's no. Um, if if Phil calls it the not even once principle, um, that if you understand um, the resurrection, which he argues for uh, in a very similar way to Dom's, uh, but if you understand the resurrection as a kind of interventionist action that happened once, mm -hmm. um, or maybe like a few special times. Yeah. You now are worshiping and calling the God of love, the one that set by every time a child mm -hmm. was murdered, right. someone was abused. Like just go through the problem of evil and suffering. That the, the, the God who could have done X, Y, and Z uh, set on the sidelines in the Shoah. Um, so, so don't assume that uh, people are disregarding um, this, the, the, their commitment to the gospel when they interpret these texts differently, oftentimes it's funded by their engagement with philosophical theology and science. Sometimes it's a moral question about being internally consistent about divine action. Other times, I mean, there's just all these layers. So just, uh, and there are a bunch of questions around it that weren't directly in the chat, weren't directly related to what Dom said, 
Um, but I have 1,700 episodes, so there's plenty of uh, uh, chances yeah. to hear more. But I want to let uh, Diana, you know, ask us the last uh, ask the last question, wrap up how she wants. <laughs> oh dear! <laughs> uh, I, I, recently, I was at a at an event where I had just preached, and I was getting ready to take off after the Sunday service when during the announcements, the pastor got up and said, oh, and by the way, Professor Bass is going to be with the youth group right after the service. Yeah. (laughs) And no one had told me. (laughs) So so I literally had to have had a youth group presentation in my mind during the Sunday service. And you just did that same thing to me, Tripp. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, I, I don't know that I have a question so much, Dom, is just give you some space to um, make some final comments. I simply wanted to say that I thought your lecture was brilliant. It's a model, I think, of how to do a lecture like that, that involves history and sort of the theological implications and gets uh, people to understand context and and scripture in a, in, a, in a new way. There were a couple of moments in it that were real, um, like, oh, moments for me. You know, I'm, I'm a person who knows this stuff pretty well. And I, I just loved the way that you described the Western metaphor as if the Gospels had told the story of the crucifixion, but only told the story of Jesus getting arrested and then this, then had moved the story or moved the frame to Mary, his mother, cod, you know, holding the, the broken dead body of her son. Mm-hmm. And leaving all that stuff out, and uh, that sort of that that sets up that h- how I think that what the Western imagination really works uh, around the resurrection is that essentially we go from the death to the ascension without asking the questions about what happens in the middle, <laughs> and so to see that the Eastern imagination fills that in. And that filling in seems to be inspired by Paul and the imagination of uh, what what we could call early rabbinic Judaism, which is shaped in the practice of the Pharisees, I think is absolutely fascinating and really created these ties between Christianity into Christianity's Jewishness, which I I found to be quite inspiring and beautiful and helps me read the Old Testament differently. So, so anyway, those were just some moments for me that were incredibly helpful as a historian and as a person of faith and as a a person who trusts the spiritual leadership that my own communities invest in me to try to tell this tale better. Okay. So, so I wanted to thank you for, for that. And then just to sort of ask is a little bit more, if you could talk about the evolutionary hope, indeed, if we can move toward what you think is a more, um, biblical, uh, more um, humane metaphor um, about the omission, the resurrection. Um, how do you imagine that speaking to the to right now? Okay. Um, basically, as I see it, our species, that's homo... <laughs> <laughs> homo sapiens. I mean, it's marvelous. It's, it's a perfect oxymoron, the wise homo. Homo sapiens got out of Africa 70,000 years ago. Our species. And what did we do? We declared a triple, a, a three-front war on ourselves, our own species, all other species, and the environment. Uh, that's what we've been doing. That's an evolutionary challenge. It's not just an ethical challenge. It's it's a question about the viability of our species, whether we are, with all due respect and love, maybe as beautiful as a saber-toothed tiger, but equally doomed. Maybe we are. 
I, I don't say that with any uh, apocalyptic expectation or anything else. It's just, it's an open question. We are that evolutionary anomaly. I could say mistake. I could say challenge. Or let's say anomaly that we are a social species with individual wills. Now, how would the ants and the bees and the other social species work if everyone had an individual will? So that's our challenge. Can we, can we negotiate that anomaly? Or will we come down on one side or the other? So I see that as the evolutionary challenge. And quite frankly, I'm going to look at anything religious or political and ask myself, do I see it helping that challenge to forestall the doom? <laughs> now, I'm, I'm not thinking apocalyptic. I really am. At, you know, sometimes people get to 19, they're getting ready for their own sunset. They want the sunset for the whole world. No, I'm not thinking like that at all. It's a very calm looking at a record. No prophecy, but trajectory. Trajectory. How are we doing and what have we been doing and, and how do I expect it to continue? So I would hope that what I'm looking for in Christianity or any other religion or any other politics, do I see it in the long run as best I can see helping us with that <laughs> anomalous situation that we have, that we might survive and thrive and prevail, <laughs> as Faulkner said. My hope is we will. But I have no guarantees. I don't think there's any lifeboats. The thing I just said in the new book is that we are not on the Titanic. We are the iceberg. That's what we have to face. We are not on the Titanic. That's sort of an apocalyptic vision. We are the iceberg. That's an evolutionary vision. So that's what I'm after. That's the most important thing for me. Do you say that in the Caesar book? No, the book that I have at the moment, I mean, that I've been hinting at here, is a book called Paul the Pharisee. You now know why it's called Paul the Pharisee. <laughs> it's Paul as Pharisee. It's the subtitle is A Vision Beyond the Normalcy of Civilization. No, beyond the, A Vision Beyond the Violets of Civilization. It is, inshallah, going to be published by, by definitely by Westar Institute, and it will be probably out next month. And we're going to have a a conversation at, with Westar on, I think it's April 17th, on the new book. But it is basically taking that revolution as the pivot from Jesus, as part of the story of Jesus, as he said, to Paul, as the, the, the place where they really join, so that... You can see who Paul is, and it's crucial for me, as I've been saying all over this, that we used to talk about the new Paul because he was a Jew. I want to do. <laughs> I'm talking about the newer Paul. He's not just a Jew. He's a Pharisee. There's lots of different types of Jews in the first century. Josephus was one of them. Josephus was a Jew. So were Annas and Caiaphas. It, it really is a... It's absolutely accurate and totally inadequate to say that Jesus or Paul were Jews. Of course, but don't think you've gone anywhere then. All you've done is do little remedial work. Paul is a Pharisee, and he becomes what I call a Messianic Christic Pharisee. But he doesn't stop being a Pharisee. That's why he's able to convert, as I see it, because I don't know how you can convert and 100% is gone and a new 100% takes over. That didn't work if I could come down from the sublime to the ridiculous. In my own case, I left the priesthood, became a professor. The continuity was biblical scholarship. I don't know if a human being can lose 100% and convert to another 100%. I think that's, that would be a psychotic break. So I think what Paul's great intuition was, the Pharise my Pharisaic vision was right, but it has begun with Jesus. So, both and. If it's not this one, it can't be that one. So I think that's Paul, as I said, that's the beating heart of Paul, as I see it. <laughs> You've just given me something else to be attacked for on Twitter, because the only other time people come at me 
more than they do for the resurrection is when I defend the Pharisees. <laughs> okay. Diana, the, the biggest problem for me in, in the Jesus Hour Network is not to get trapped in negativity. I do not take what people say about far, uh, resurrection and I go spend my life defending counter to them. If people want to take it literally, good luck to it. <laughs> Fine. I mean, all right. I, I, I go very seriously with trip. Though if, if you have one intervention, then you have a big problem theologically. And somebody's going to say to you sometime, why me? And you have no answer to why me. Why did the, the hurricane destroy my church and not yours <laughs> as it went down the street? Yeah, but I think what has happened to me, as far as I can see, is I didn't set out to do any of this. Honestly, we were just kind of minding our own business, touring Turkey with 40 people trying to find Paul. We thought we had him, by the way, but anyway, in search of Paul. And then all of a sudden you end up in these Byzantine churches, Cappadocian caves, and you see this all around you. I don't know how not to respond, but I'm left a little bit flattened, not flattered, but I could have missed all that. Yeah. What if he'd never gone there? One church would never have done it. It had to be everywhere from, as I said, from Spain to Syria. That see, this this is. So it was a, it was a profound revelation to me. Even though it wasn't, you know, any kind of a <gasps> ecstasy or anything else, it just slow, chi 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 everywhere. Wow, we thought this was the resurrection. It was just one mode of it. So, sorry, I'm repeating myself. I know. Oh, I just want to, uh, it, it gives me a chance to say in public that I think that had Marcus been here to be your conversation partner through these more recent years, that I, I think he would love this. Yeah. I think he would have actually loved talking to you about this and listening to that moment, th th that trajectory of really all that you encountered um, in that search and in this amazing art um, that you're sharing with yeah. us. With and us. it really was Marianne and Marcus who invited us in the year 2000, said to Sarah and myself, would you like to come with us as co-hosts? We're, we're moving from Israel to Turkey and we're going to talk not about Jesus there, but about Paul here. Would you like to be involved in that we said yes we'd love it of course I, I then i watched what happened on the one level what watching paul among the ruins did to americans after 9 11 by the way a totally different paul get him out of the 17th century uh, uh, yeah uh, the 1600 get him into the first century get him out of the reformation into rome i watched it happen to us leaders and the people who were with us but then this other thing happened. We had to give a talk every night. Um, uh, Marianne would start with a prayer, then Marcus would talk for half an hour, I'd talk for half an hour. And during the day, what if you'd gone into a church and seen this weird resurrection? And you could see it was a resurrection because right next to here was the crucifixion. Everyone saw everyone else looks just like it. We're in the Cappadocian cave and everything we recognize. No problems. Right next to the crucifixion, is this weirdo taking these other, uh, what's this? I mean, it says, hey, Anastasis is on it. So, yeah, it's the resurrection. And sometimes it says Adam and Eve, in case you're lost on them. And I have to talk that night about Paul. I can't not talk about what we spent the afternoon looking at. That's how it happened. To, in, I think it was September of 2002, the evening after being in the Cappadocian caves, and you had to give a talk. You could not, because that's in everyone's mind. And you're heading for Istanbul and that great big magnificent one in the Cora. And again, you're going to have to talk at night about Paul. I didn't plan that. Yeah. Absolutely didn't. It happened to me. But I had to respond to it because I had 40 people to talk to about it, and that's what I, in all their vision, the image is in there. You can't say, well, we talk about Paul. So, 
Well, what a glorious decade of work you've given us as a result of all that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, this has been uh, quite a bit of fun. Um, Thank you, Diana, for joining us for a resurrection session. Um, uh, A number of you mentioned in uh, the comments, excitement about Dom's upcoming book, we're going to do something on the podcast about it not long after it comes out and uh, towards the end of the year, we're going to do a visual class where he'll do what you just experienced um, uh, going through the book. So you'll be able to read the book, see the lectures and all the uh, all the uh, images and such and then get to dig in. So um, we're super excited about that. Uh, thanks again, Dom. Uh, I love getting to work with you. Uh, who would have thought when, you know, I started reading you and after asking lots of my, my, uh, parents and youth ministers questions in high school, uh, that we'd get to do stuff like this on the internet. Quite a bit of fun. Do you, hey, do you guys notice that we're basically 25 years apart? Oh yeah. That Dom's yeah. 90, I'm 65 and you're 41. Really? It's a really interesting sort of picture of intergenerational conversation and I don't know I respect both of you so much I just am so pleased I can be in the middle <laughs> oh, yeah. thank this you very much again and thank you Trip, very much alright thank you hey you made it all the way to the end of the episode congratulations Perhaps, perhaps you have a friend you want to share this with. You know, sharing the brew, that's always the best thing to do. And if you love it, if you want this kind of material to keep popping and happening and blowing up on the internet for all the people to hear, then head over to homebrewedcommunity.com. You can become a part of the community, help support the podcast each month, and get all sorts of fun goodies like the members-only podcast feed with lots of excellent, excellent bonus episodes, lectures, and audiological treats. 